what's up guys david one two two and it's list day you're probably seeing this on a wednesday because i'm taking uh, monday off from the live stream to record this and then i'm busy on tuesday so i won't be able to do much editing so this will go up on a wednesday however i think i'm going to actually change the schedule of the week because i'm front loading the week too much with a video on tuesday and the monday live stream and then never having the energy the time or the uh fortitude in order to actually do a video later in the week and that just seems kind of silly so i think i'm going to move list day to wednesday which gives me two days to edit which normally I, I i'm constantly going over anyway so it just makes more sense so i don't have to rush it's better for me it's more healthy and uh it, it spreads it out a little bit and then i might actually be more inclined on like a thursday or a friday to do something as well because I, i'd like to actually start doing two videos a week again assuming my overtime uh dials back a little bit but anyway let's get started with what are, what are we doing? Power of the Duelist. Now the last set was actually pretty promising. We had cards like Macrocosmos and Dim Fissure, which made us feel like, hey, look, GX, you're finally actually having good cards in the set. That's really cool. But but no, Power of the Duelist this should be Poop of the Duelist. The set the set's bad. It's precursors to what is yet to come next week. Ooh, the legendary set. But let's get through Power of the Duelist so that we can have more fun next time with Cyberdark Impact. As always, we're gonna try to be as objective with the set as possible, look at the cards when they came out and try to assess them as they were, and then if they ever manage to get some more support later down the road, we will then consider them as like a secondary thing, which actually comes up a couple times on this list, which is at least interesting. Also, there's no banned cards this time around, um, or even limited. One of them was, so that's interesting, but, uh, there's not even like one ban card to save the list, so that's that's kind of sad. But anyway, number ten. Neo Spatian Aqua Dolphin. You bet you never would have thought a Neo Spatian would have been on a best of anything list in Yu-Gi-Oh. Uh, yeah, unless the list was um, top ten cards that are much better than the rest of their archetype. And in which case this entry would be Grand Mole. But no, Aqua Dolphin actually managed to see some niche play, uh, what, last format as a basically a way of cheesing the end of a duel. So it's really hard to say that he's bad because with the passage of time, he managed to become better due to a rule change. He suffers the same fate as Grinder Golem, where when the card came out, it was hot dookie. But later in the game, rules change, things change everything's changing so aqua dolphin accidentally becomes good so i put him at number 10 to be safe because he was accidentally good but he's at least interesting what does he do a level three water warrior that has the following effect discard one card and look at your opponent's hand and select a monster in their hand if you control a monster on your field that has an attack equal or higher to the monster you selected you can destroy that target and and then burn your opponent for 500 damage uh and, and it goes to the graveyard obviously and if, if it's not, then, then then you take the 500 damage. Why is this card at least good in modern Yu-Gi-Oh? Well, it's a warrior, so it's, 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 it's pretty searchable. It has homes and things like Goki, so that's cool. But no, the, the, really what we care about is the fact that everyone's running hand traps. Everyone's been running hand traps, and they tend to have low attack power. Even so low as to be as low or lower than Neospatian Aqua Dolphin. And they tend to be running rampant in the format, so it's pretty, uh, pretty... Good odds your opponent has a Droll and Lockbird, Ash Blossom, or Ghost Ogre in their hand at any given time. So, normal summoning your Aqua Dolphin, discarding the card, and knocking an Ash out of their hand is actually quite a handy little utility for the card. And uh, that added 500 burn can mean that if it's like game three and it's getting really close to the end of the round, you might be able to cheese a victory with a monster that is decently searchable in your deck and gets that extra 500 burn damage before time is called. So it has a lot of dual purpose in the modern format, and it's actually quite interesting because uh, all these weird experimental cards that GX is making, every once in a while, one of them will pop up because all of their effects are so very strange that one of them has to be good sometime, right? Paths of Destiny. Oh, the old Nurse Burn player in me wanted to put this higher, but it's not that great. But it does see play in that deck. What does it do? Both players flip a coin. The guys that get heads gain 2,000 life points. The guys that get tails take 2,000 life points of damage. 2,000 life points is quite a bit of burn damage for one card, 
meaning that even though it's a 50-50 shot, you know, you're doing at least half the time quite a bit of decent burn damage to your opponent. However, the added ability of this card in Nurse Burn means that it does not matter whether your opponent gets the heads or the tails because you have Nurse Wreck Through the Fallen, or whatever her errata Dark World name is, or Bad Reaction to Samuchi, Death to Smoochie, just doesn't matter what they get. So, you know, you can always be assured your whether or not you're burning yourself is kind of still a question, but you're still at least for sure hitting your opponent for 2,000 damage, which is a lot. And when combined with things like Gift Card and Paz, what is it called? The Paz of Destiny. <laughs> Uh, try and guess. That's the other card. You can probably hit your opponent for like, you know, an easy 8 or 9k damage. Sabersaurus. See, this is how you know it's not a very good set when a vanilla gets on the list. But anyway, what what, what is Sabersaurus? Sabersaurus is a 1900 level 4 beater that doesn't do anything because it's a normal monster. However, it's an earth dinosaur, which is really solid typing. And in the future, we would eventually get Rescue Rabbit. And then in the future, we'd also get Loggy and Dulka, which were the things you'd make with this thing. And then you'd have Dino Rabbit. And that was a good deck. And uh, dinosaurs kind of could still play this kind of thing. Obviously, they got a better one now. It's got like 2,000 attack. But if you want that old school feel, you know, Sabersaurus is still cool. He's still cool. He can still hang with the cool. What am I talking about? It's really, really hard to stretch a discussion about a vanilla. I could read its flavor text, but... Ah, hell. This normally gentle dinosaur enjoys relaxing in its nest in the prairies. If it becomes angered, it turns terribly uh, ferocious. Cool. Now, this next one was a bit controversial in the Discord. Um, the alien player was like, nah, bro, and I was like, pfft, so, <laughs> take that one with you, Will. Uh, alien Hunter! It could, it, he, he made the argument that in modern Yu-Gi-Oh, uh, the mind beam thing that's like a change of heart for something with an A counter is probably a better card, but, I don't know. He does what the deck is trying to do, like, he, he, he forwards their game state, even if it's not a very good one. Alien Hunter is a level 4 water reptile with the following ability. If this monster destroys a monster with an A counter on it, it can, in battle, it can, it can attack again. So like I said, it forwards your game state. It gets you field presence and advantage, albeit really slowly and totally relying on giving this thing presumably some sort of attack boost because at 1600 it's not, it's not awesome, but it's not, it's not totally weak. It can move mirror shield or something. Again, the alien beam thing, I'll throw a picture up. That could also be this set. They, they need one, they need one representative. I don't know. Deck is, deck's not very good, but okay, fine. Whatever, next. Baby Cerasaurus. There's actually a couple dinosaur cards in this set. And actually, Baby Cerasaurus sees modern play. Um, so that's cool. This card is destroyed by a card effect and sent to the graveyard. Special summon a dinosaur from your deck. As long as it's level four or lower. The cool thing about this card is it does not specify that the card needs to be on the field, so destroying this in your hand means you can special summon a dinosaur from your deck. So things like your uh, Fire King Island or your uh, True Dr Draco's Field Spell, uh, Dragonic Diagram. Both of those destroy cards in your hand, which means if you destroy this thing, you get a free dinosaur, so you can do your plays. Because you can get the Over Raptor or the other one. I can't remember which one you get first because I don't play that deck. But uh, it's a good play starter, although it's a bit of a two card combo. I remember I was running this in a Jurak deck I posted years ago because it was, we just got Fire King Island. I think it was announced. I was like, oh, you can play Juraks again because you can pop Baby Cerasaurus. It was totally bricky and silly. But, you know, I was playing 40 chests on that one because. Because Diagram Dinos was like a thing years later, so, you know, I don't know where I'm going with that. The cold medicine's real. Destiny Hero Dog Person. Destiny Hero Dogma is uh, certainly a Destiny Hero. Man, like this set's not even like funny bad, it's boring bad. Which is just like, that's really lame. Like, if, if I want them to be bad, like, you'll lose the duel. And I could sit here and, and bitch for, you know, like, ten minutes each card. And we all laugh because they're so 
they're so outrageously poor, but they're all just kind of mediocre and lackluster. That's kind of fun. But anyway, anyway uh, d Dogma. Cannot be normal, summoned or set. You can special summon this thing by tributing three monsters. <sighs> okay. As long as one of them is a destiny hero, presumably malicious. Because I don't know how else you're spamming the field and having any kind of board presence if you're running this deck. And it's like an old version that's actually running Dogma. But anyway, what does he do? Once per turn, during the standby phase of your opponent, the turn after you special summon this thing, uh, you can half your opponent's life points. It's like a 4,000 burn card for, uh, at max, I guess, unless your opponent's like playing Metaphys with, with like uh, uh, that soul absorption and their life points or some absurd craziness, then you, I guess you could presumably just, you know, half them for a lot more than four. But traditionally it's, it's four or lower. And that's a lot, that's a lot of burn damage. It's not really burn because it's, it's, it's modulation of life points, so it doesn't really count as an effect damage, but, but that's kind of... Uh, that's nitpicking. It's uh, a solid, easy way in order to push for an OTK because he does have 3,400 attack. So him and his effect, that's like almost all of your opponent's life points. So if you're playing a moderately competent deck with Dogma in it, it's probably pretty easy to win, assuming you can resolve his effect. It's a little slow. That's a thing. But you know what? He's, of all the Destiny heroes that came out in this set, he's, he's arguably the better one. Malicious, he is not. Anyway. Number four is next. Mausoleum of the Emperor. I actually really like this card. Is it super good? Uh, no. Is it at least interesting? Sure. Mausoleum of the Emperor allows you to normal summon monsters that would require a tribute by paying a thousand life points per tribute instead. Like if I wanted to normal summon my blue eyes white dragon right from my hand, I can pay 2k life because it takes two tributes to normal summon it. This is their normal summon. But it does not count as a tribute summon, which is it's interesting, I guess. It'd be a weird way for monarchs to to get around Mask of Restrict. <laughs> ha ha! Gotcha! This is just an interesting card because it allows you to kind of skirt the rules a little bit. And all those cards are always kind of interesting. They're kind of neat. Um, is it super great? No. I mean, presumably you could unbrook a hand in something like Monarchs or Cosmos or some other, like, I don't know, True Draco, some deck that runs a bunch of big guys that, you know, needs another engine or something in order to make Tribute fodder. A Tribute Summon deck or a deck that has big... You know what I'm trying to say, you know, I don't know why I'm getting frustrated trying to talk to somebody when you're just a camera. It's not like you're actually all out there watching me get frustrated as I'm trying to form sentences. <laughs> oh, I kind of picture it. You got, like, some guy falling asleep. Some kid booing. Oh, I've got to make my own fun this list, right? Is that what this is? is, that what this is? That's what this is. Overall, being a field spell makes it super searchable. At least not as not as much as it used to be because we lost to terraforming. But we still got metaverse. Woo! But, uh, you know, if you're trying to put some fancy schmancy tech in your obsolete monarchs or true dracos, this is certainly a cheesy thing you could do. You could have some fun with it, I suppose. It's a neat card. It's a good one to have in our arsenal because it's one of those kind of effects that later down the road it just might be super useful in a particular deck. Overload Fusion! Oh yeah, here we go. You can fusion summon one Dark Machine monster from your extra deck by banishing the fusion material from your field or your graveyard. Banishing two monsters from your field and then losing the spell is super booty. However, banishing two monsters and just losing the spell from the field from your graveyard is that's really good card economy. It's, uh, it makes your fusion spell a one for one, which is, you know, more that can be said by most fusion spells. In a deck like Cyber Dragons, where you're probably also contact fusing, you may actually have some machines in your graveyard in order to make the, uh, the next entry on the list, which is presumably the target for this card. However, it does have some other things it can make. It's a really cool card. It's just a solid fusion card. Um, any fusion card that banishes things from the graveyard as cost is always going to be good in my book. It's a good card. Um, it also doesn't do a hell of a lot. <sighs> wow. But let's just get to the next one so we can talk about its target. That's probably more interesting. Number two is Chimera Tech Overdragon. Again, presumably what you're searching with Overload Fusion. Although, you could make this with uh, uh, a few things, but sure. He's a level 9 machine dark fusion monster that requires one cyber dragon and then one other machine. 
or more. When he's fusion summoned, you send all other monsters you control to the graveyard, so he's your only guy on board. However, if you're using this in a deck, you probably use them all to fusion summon, because again, you can use Cyber Dragon plus other stuff. So, you know, presumably you, you fuse them all anyways, that's not a that's not a big deal. But why would you why would you nag yourself like three cards just to make a big beater? Well, it's because he's a really big beater. The original attack and defense of this guy becomes 800 times the number of fusion materials used, so presumably he can get su super big. Also, he can attack a number of times per battle phase, up to the number of fusion materials used to make him. So if you made him with four monsters, he can attack four times. So the bigger he gets, the more he can attack, which makes him an OTK machine. He can, if, if your opponent just doesn't have much response to it, you're, you're probably going to you're gonna do some serious damage. That's a lot of damage. Again, not the most interesting target for Overload Fusion, but it's like the first target for Overload Fusion, if you consider the it coming out as the first of it. Well, I mean, was an anachronistic target technically the first target, or is it the target that's more readily available to the player because it's right out of the pack with it? I don't know, that's, that's a weird question. Anyway. Honorable mention. Honorable mentions are always super fun in a set that's not very good because it's like, wow, I struggled to get 10. Let's try to get like 11 or 12. First up is Submarine Roid. Yeah, Roids got on here mostly because otherwise the whole list would have been all the Destiny heroes because they're all okay. But no, Sub uh, Roids got a they got a they got a they got a guy on here. It's an honorable mention, not a not a not a main lister, but. He's okay. You also could probably give this uh, give this spot to their fusion spell that they also got in the set because it's honestly okay uh, for in archetype or in theme, I guess. In theme, I think it's in theme. I don't think they're technically no, they're an archetype. They are an archetype because you have the one that draws two cards, the trap card. They are an archetype. They have an archetype uh, fusion spell, so that's that's cool. But I like Submarine Roy because he can attack directly, and he's got 800 attack. Right? And then he goes to defense mode after he attacks, and he's got 1800 defense, so he's got a big-ish booty, he can attack directly, so then he can, and then he can, don't have to worry about a retaliation, and in modern Yu-Gi-Oh! with rule four, or rule set four, uh, and the end of match procedures, uh, 4.1, <laughs> is that what those would be? I don't know. Uh, he can cheese a game. He can, he can cheese a game. Why is he not on the list? Well, because uh, any of the battle damage he does is always the original attack of this monster. It's not like you could give him an attack boost or something and then, like, hit him with limiter removal and OTK with submarine roid like a, like a jerk. But no, you can't do that. He can only ever do 800. So that's, that's interesting, I suppose. Next up is Elemental Hero Neos. Yeah, Neos, man. I was blown away when I learned that Neos took this long to come out, considering that he's Jaden's ace monster, uh, and he's like a mid-GX card. I guess the, the logic here was he has, apparently his, his deck changes uh, part way through the series. He loses his heroes and goes more uh, Neos Bayesian, I guess? Don't quote me on that, never saw a GX. He's kind of like in this weird position where he's got as, almost as much support as Dark Magician. He has like the exact same stats. It's just that Dark Magician clearly has the far better support and making a deck solely around Elemental Hero Neos isn't super great. You can use Hero Flash on it. But uh, to not mention him at all would be kind of a, would be a crime because he is a, a like a fan favorite famous card and he's a boss or uh, ace monster of one of the main protagonists. Plus, you know, his support is okay, it exists. So I should at least mention him. And probably the best part about him is you can do this with him in YGO Pro. Jamal, hee hee. But the hero hater in me gets to at least chuckle a little bit because I get to include a Neo Spatian on the Dishonorables and they're like once removed from heroes. They're almost heroes. They're kind of heroes. And they're all, and, they're, and you're bad. One's good, one's okay. Not this one, Neo Spatian Flare Scarab. He's a uh, dishonorable mention for being horribly, horribly unmentionable. His effect might as well not exist, and he would otherwise fall into obscurity if not for being tied to a main protagonist. This card gains four in attack for every spell or trap your opponent controls. Wow, it's the best anti-pendulum tech ever. Card's broke. Not really, it's, it's really bad. Uh, it's only useful when your opponent has a massive board of back row, which is probably self-defeating because if your opponent has five back row and a field spell and they can't do anything about your flare scarab, 
you are somehow playing a worse deck than the one you are currently using. And that's, that's pretty impressive. So cards that rely on you being in such a horribly losing scenario means they're mostly dead most of the time. And if they aren't completely broken when you're losing, like Exiton Knight, then you are still going to be losing. So thanks, Flare Scarab, for being horribly unremarkable. And before we get to number one, I just want to mention my sponsor, MetaMats, again. I'm probably going to do this every list video, so you guys are going to have to deal with it. <laughs> I really love their mats. I love them. They're, they're just really cool guys, and they always help me out with my tournaments and stuff. So I'm happy to support them. And if you guys want to go over to MetaMats and check out all their cool stuff and get your own custom cloth playmat with one of their new fancy materials, they're always updating them, use the code right there, troll, troll to Meta, and you'll get like 10% off or whatever it is. So, so go for it, homie. Mm. Mm. Ah, number one. Number one is a really strange, strange thing because it was eroded. And when it was, when it was, uh, unerotted, it was on the ban list. So it would have been number one anyway, and it was actually quite good. Now it's actually kind of bad, but it still might be one of the better cards in the set. So good, good for it. Future Fusion. We just got a mess of alternate polymerizations this set. That's at least a novelty. Reveal one fusion monster from your extra deck, then send the fusion material of that monster to your graveyard from your deck. During your second standby phase, you can fusion summon that monster or a monster that is at least with the same name as the one you revealed, presumably in case you're running more than one copy, for free. And if that monster leaves the field, you destroy this thingy, and then if this thing's destroyed, you kill the monster. Like, it's like a call of haunted. Oh, wow. Um, this card's really good. Uh, it almost doesn't matter what you are fusion summoning, as long as the fusion material are something you can use in the graveyard. Uh, you almost don't care about the fusion monster. You just care the fact that you could presumably mill a bunch of monsters out of your deck. It makes it a less generic painful choice, but a painful choice nonetheless. So obviously this card was banned because you had decks like Worms where their fusion monster was as many worms as you want so they would literally mill every monster in their deck. Like that's, that's bogus. Obviously Cyber Dragons would love this card because you could just dump Cyber Dragons in the grave and you could use them for stuff. Like there's tons of decks that wouldn't mind being able to just run a cheesy fusion monster in order to get some graveyard set up. So it got banned. They managed to errata the card and take it off the ban list and now it's at three. But it's a shell of its former self. But like I said, it still might be one of the better cards in the set. What does it do now? Well, it pretty much does exactly the same thing, except uh, the milling of the fusion material happens on the standby phase after you've used the card. So before it was, I play the card, mill my guys, wait two turns, get a dude. Now it's play the card, uh, nothing happens, wait a turn, then mill my guys, wait another turn, and then, and then get a guy. The problem with that is it's now horribly slow and using it as a mass foolish burial no longer works because now you're doing it a turn later and in modern Yu-Gi-Oh when this card came off the ban list that's presumably too slow and kind of booty. However, you know, playing casually it's probably still kind of a blowout so I'd give it a shot in certain decks. But anyway guys that was Power of the Duelist. Power of the uh, boringness. Set was horribly unremarkable, but it is, it is a return to form for mid GX apparently, uh, getting us really, really hyped up for the next set, uh, Cyber Dark Impact. So come back next week for Cyber Dark Impact. I might do something special for it. I'm un yet undecided on it, because um, it is renowned for being one of the worst sets in the game. So that'll be fun. Anyway, guys, let me know in the comments below what you guys think. Remember, guys, if you don't troll the matter who will, I will see you guys next time. Remember to subscribe so that you don't miss any of my totally rad dueling. Watching more of these videos is almost as fine as Taya's ass? What? I'm not saying that. Fine. Then it's time to duel.